Uh, again, round of applause for your. Uh, um, oh, actually, uh, bef before I get started, like it's beginning of the semester, people are leaving stuff. Uh, there. So again, if you, if you, uh, someone left the umbrella last time, and then uh, someone left uh, zigzags. Wait, that's that's mine. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and then. Uh, Someone left brass knuckles. You may leave these. <laughs> oh, <laughs> <one too. laughs> All right. Wait, why do you have those? Because <laughs> I, I do databases. That makes sense. Okay. All right. All right. Um, for those in the class, uh, again, homework one is and project zero are due this Sunday, and then project one we are we hope to release uh, later today or, or early next. Or sorry, next next Tuesday. Um, any questions about homework one or project zero? Yes. Uh, on on so on the website or on on Grayscope? I right, I'll we'll fix that. Yeah. Everything will always be due eleven fifty nine p.m. the day it's due. Yes. So the question is: Are are you allowed to use SQL like keywords that are not what? Yeah, why not? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, if, if, you, if you can, if there's something that SQL, if, if there's a way to make the SQL better, do it. Yes. Okay, cool. Um, the other thing too, also, and I'll post this, a reminder on this on Piazza, uh, we have a seminar series this semester. We're inviting outside speakers, or people from outside the university to come talk about their database systems. Uh, so there's to be a combination of, well, they're all pretty much at companies the first speaker at uh, on Monday is a famous database researcher in German. He's probably the best database researcher in all of Europe, uh, if not the world. Um, so he 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 had a database system that he sold to uh, Tableau, and then if you download Tableau or now now it's done by Salesforce, you get his database system. So he's building a new one. To, so Thomas is going to talk about his system, but there's a bunch of other ones coming later this semester. So I'll post a reminder on Slack. This is optional for the class. You're, you're not required to attend, but. If you want to go beyond the things that we're talking about this semester, uh, I highly encourage you to check these things out. Okay? Oh, shoot, sorry. All right. So, um, the in the last class, we were spending time talking about introducing the idea of a disk-oriented database system, right? And we said that a disk-oriented database system would be one where the, the the software is set up or it's written in such a way that it assumes that the primary storage location of the database is on disk. That means at any time you go read a page, that page may not be in memory. It's on disk, and you got to do something to get it. So we'll talk about you know how we move things back and forth next semester, um, or sorry, not ne next next week, not next semester, <laughs> next week, because uh, th that is project one. Um, but the the last class we spent time talking about uh, you know, what do the actual files look like on disk? What what do the pages look look like on disk? Um, and we spent time talking about what I would loosely call as a page-oriented architecture. So the database heap file was being broken up to pages. Uh, and then the, we knew how to way, we're using the record IDs to get the page number and the offset in a slot array to go grab that page we wanted, paste in the page directory, bring it in, and then figure out, find the exact location that had the data that we're looking for. So at a high level, the way you would insert a new record into this architecture, or a new tuple, is that you would look for the page directory. Uh, find where that is. That would have some kind of information to say, here's the pages that are free or have empty space. Go retrieve that page. If it's in memory, great. So you just use it. Otherwise, you go to disk and read it. And then you can look at that empty that, that slot array to find the first empty slot where you'll, you'll, you can put your tuple into it. right? If you want to update an ex existing record or existing, existing tuple that already resides in a page, you do the same thing. You look in the page directory, find where the page that you want is located, retrieve it. Uh, getting it from disk if necessary. Then you use that slot array to find the location, the, the offset within the page that has the tuple you want to modify. And then if your new data, your new tuple will fit, right, you know, write, write, overwrite the old one. Otherwise, you got to find a new space in the page where uh, your new tuple will fit and then you know, put that one in there and then delete the old one. If your tuple doesn't fit in the, new, in the existing page, or sorry, your new update doesn't fit in the existing page, you got to go update another page, right? 
So this is the high level architecture that we're talking about for most of the semester. And this is how typically I would say it's becoming less common, but this is typically the way you know, traditionally database systems have been built for the last 30, 40, 50 years. So what are some problems with this approach? We touched on these a little bit last time without jumping ahead in the slides. Uh, if you have the PDF, what are some what's, what's, what are some problems with what we just talked about so far? Yes, so disk retrieval could be expensive. Um, yes, uh, but there's if it's a disk oriented architecture, it's somewhat unavoidable. If you got to read it, you got to read it. Nothing you can do. So there's sort of three things. First is sort of fragmentation. Right, where the we may not be able to get the entire tuple um, in the page, and we may have to go update a, a bunch of multiple pages. Right, so now we're doing a bunch of random writes, uh, which is going to be bad. Uh, since the page we may have to bring in may have a bunch of data or tuples that we don't care about. Right, we were trying to update one tuple. We got to bring in the page that has a bunch of other tuples. We don't care about those things. We got to go read read them too. Right, because they're along for the ride. Because again, non-volatile storage is going to be block oriented. So we can't go get exact byte ranges of the data we need. We got to go bring uh, the entire page in. Again, now if you're doing, uh, if you're updating a lot of pages, sorry, a lot of tuples all at once, those tuples may reside on different pages, right? So if I got to update 20 tuples and those 20 tuples are stored in 20 different pages, not only are they going to read those 20 tuples or 20 pages in, then I got to update them. And I got to write them back out, right? And that's much much more random I/O. We talked about last class how uh, for the, the, the non-volatile storage, in general, it's going to be much faster if we can do things sequentially rather than at random, or random access. So let's also talk about a, a different world where we actually can't do in-place updates on pages. Right? Like, like this, this architecture we, we just described won't work in a world where you can't grab a page, modify it, and then overwrite the old page. You can't do that in, uh, uh, you can do it in SPD, but there's, there's some, so there's some uh, cloud platforms where you can only get append-only storage. HDFS is probably the most, HD, the Hadoop file system is probably the most famous. Most of these derivative file systems, you can only append to files. You can't overwrite existing data, right? And you do this for uh, replication and consistency issues, which we'll talk about later in the semester. But like this makes your life a lot easier when you do an attributed system, because now you don't have to worry about uh, if I write data uh, is, and then I go update it, is everyone going to get my update in time? Right? If you update, you write a file, write a page, and say, all right, here it is, guys, in perpetuity, forever. This is the contents of this page. You know, it gets deleted, sure, but like you're never going to have to make changes to it later on. That makes your distributed system way easier to build. Yes. This question is, can we not just think of updates as deletion and insertion? Yes, and that, that's where we're going next. Yes. That's how you're basically going to handle this. So for today, I'm going to talk about log structure storage mostly. Um, and this is an alternative to the page-oriented architecture that we talked about so far. Um, and I was saying this is not how systems were typically built. Postgres sort of is, looks like this in the 1980s. Uh, we'll talk about what they actually do in a second. Um, but this is becoming more common now with things like RocksDB and LevelDB. There's now like storage managers that are explicitly designed for this log structure storage. Um, so what I'll describe to you is a sort of a, a 50,000 view or a high level view of what log structure storage looks like. In the textbook, they go on about log structured merge trees. I'll, I'm not going to ignore all that. I'll explain what that is in a second. Uh, I think they go into too much, too much detail, and it's not a good uh, explanation. So I'll try to get the high level just to see, again, to, to distinguish this approach versus the page oriented approach. And then we'll talk about what the uh, what the data actually looks like instead of tuple, like how do we represent integers, floats, strings, and so forth. And then if we have time, we'll finish up talking about the, the system catalogs where we keep track of like what our tables actually look like, how many columns do they have, and, and so forth. Okay? All right, so in a log structured storage system or storage manager, uh, there's pretty much two operations we can do on, on data put and delete. And I'm not calling this insert. I'm saying put because we actually can do blind puts. We can we can overwrite things uh, at a logical level just by going put 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 over and over again. 
So for every single uh, operation we're going to do on on this on our storage storage manager, we have to provide a unique identifier. So this won't be the page number and uh, the page number and the offset we talked about before, because that doesn't exist in this world. It's some unique identifier. Something up above in the system is is figuring out. Okay, this is tuple one. This is tuple two, three, and so forth. You can think of it as a, as a simple counter. Um, and so for every single operation we're going to do as we modify the uh, table, we're just going to insert a new log entry, or new entry into this log file that we're going to maintain in memory that course, that just contains the information of what that operation was. And you can think of the appending to this file, the, the, the beginning of the file will have the oldest log records. And then over time, we keep inserting new things and, and extending the file. Right, th those are the newest ones. Right, so it's sort of going oldest and newest inside the file. So in this example here, if I want to update or modify or insert, I don't know at this point, I don't care, uh, tuple with the identifier 103, then I just put a put record in there, and then with the identifier, and then what the value is of the, of the, of the tuple. Right? For now, for simplicity, we'll just say, OK, our, this table here has, is a key value store where it's just key 103, and then the, the value is just some, some string. right? And I can keep doing this. I can do put 104. I can do delete 102, and so forth. And I keep going until, uh, until I fill up the file. If I have a delete, I don't have to put the original value in. I say, I just, I'm deleting this tuple. right? And so as the application makes changes to the database, all we're doing is keep inserting into this file. right? Pretty simple. So now, uh, when a page gets full, I got I to gotta write it out the disk. right? So that's that's pretty simple too, right? I, I have some kind of page directory that says, okay, here's the next location where I can write a page to disk because my in-memory one is full. I write that out, clear out the buffer, just do it again, keep inserting things over and over again, right? And once the the once the pages are on disk, we're immutable, meaning we're never going to go change them again. We're never going to go back and modify log record at different offsets. Once it's on disk, it's it's persistent forever. So what's the one obvious big advantage of this approach so far? Fewer disk I.O., but why? He says, you batch them up into a single write. Yeah, but like, yes, like, but it's, and it's sequential too, right? So if I update 20 tuples, I just put those 20 log records in this, my page and write that out all at once uh, versus having to go update the 20 different pages where it may, it may exist in another architecture. Yes. The question is, is write constant time? Yes, for our purposes here, yes. In actuality, I mean, so we'll get through this later in the semester. There's the algorithm complexity, and then there's the reality complexity. And our work constants matter, right? So like the algorithm's got, oh, who cares if it's like, you know, if it's 2x slower. That matters a lot in our world, right? All right. So again, we just keep doing this when this guy gets full. We just write it out, flush it out, and keep doing this. All right, so this is how you do updates and deletes, or insert to puts, right? Um, and then something up above is, is responsible for keeping track of, uh, you know, do I, if I delete a record, do I really, really have that record, right? Like, th at this lowest level here, we don't know, we don't care. Yes. The question is, do we need a backup of the MMA page? Yeah, so to her point, which we'll cover, so this is the challenge I face. I don't know at what point can I introduce these things. And like, as you're filling this, this thing up, if you have a notion of a transaction up above where it says, I want to put 104, like say the, the, the first guy up here, he does that first put, and I want to tell the application, yes, I persisted your change. You want to flush that the disk, right? So you could keep flushing this over and over again, or you could have a separate log, right? It's, there is, there, the, the, the page may actually be written a disk before the thing actually gets full, is what I'm trying to say. Yes? Okay, so your question, how would you handle this in a distributed setting? Let's, let's ignore all that, right? Let's, let's, let's learn to walk before we can run, okay? It does make things distributed. This actually is basically how sort of Paxos works because you can think of like, I mean, I mean, we're jumping way ahead, but you can think of like going back here. 
it's you want to put this in the log. You say you want to put 103. You got to get everybody to agree. Okay, put 103. That's going in the log. Then you go on to the next one. It's yeah. It's basically that thing, the block shit we talked about before. It's it's it, this is the ledger, right? Okay. All right. So this is how to do updates. Pretty straightforward. Reads get a bit more tricky now, right? Uh, because what you now need to do is you want to go sort of back in time, and try to find the, the, the newest log record for the thing that you're looking for, right? And so maybe you luck out. You're trying to find 105, record 105. And so you just start at the end of the log and go in reverse order. And lo and behold, the first log record has put 105. I know that's the newest version for 105 that could exist in my database, right? Ignoring distributed systems, ignoring multiple threads. It's in there. That's good. Now I know what the value is of 105 is, right? Right, so you get, or, yeah, 102, whatever. Um, so that's fine, but obviously this is going to be slow if uh, if I got to scan the, the file or scan the in-memory page over and over again. And furthermore, maybe if the thing I want isn't in the in-memory page, now I got to go to disk and find it, right? So that sucks. So what you'll do instead, and this is what the log structure merge tree stuff that's in the textbook, and we, we can we can ignore for now. Um, what you can do instead also, or in addition to maintaining this log record, you maintain an index. Again, we'll explain indexes in two weeks. I think it's just like a glossary in the back of the textbook. You look up a keyword, it tells you the page number. You can jump to that page to find the thing you're looking for versus like scanning through the page one after another, right? So you would have this index that for all these different IDs, it'll give you the location of the, the latest log record for, the, you know, for that given ID. So now if I want to go find page 102 or record 102, I look at my index, and it'll tell me that you know if I follow the pointer, it'll take me to the the latest log record. I know what happened to it. Yes. Uh, so his question is: If you is this index? Is it transient or ephemeral? Meaning it's just in memory. If I crash and come back, I got to rebuild it. No, because that would be slow. They get extremes. They get petabytes. I don't want to go scan a petabyte data to build my index. This will be persistent. Right? Yes. Correct, yes. We, we, his statement is we have to make sure the data and index are in sync. Yes, and we'll, we'll get to that later. Yes. The question is, a, why isn't a hash table being used as the index? Uh, so he's, yeah, so we're getting ahead of ourselves. The question is, why would why are like B plus trees, like the merge trees, the Cassandra guys are looking at tries? Like, why are uh, there's being skip lists for using these as well? Why are tree data structures used instead of hash tables for these lookups? Because you then can't do. Sometimes you want to do range scans. I want to get all. I want to give me give me the log records 101 to for, for ID 101 to 103. I can't do that in a hash table. Okay. So, what's the what's the, what's the obvious problem with this is that the log is going to grow forever, right? Because all I'm doing is to keep inserting things over and over again, and eventually I'll, I'll run out of space, right? If I have say uh, if I have a table with a million tuples and I but I only ever update one. Right? I'll just keep making log records for all those updates, and the log files just keep growing forever. If it's a page-oriented architecture, then I don't have that problem because I just overwrite the old one over and over again. It's not exactly how they work, but again, we, we, we ignore that for now. So all of these log structure systems have to do what is called compaction. The basic idea here is that you're going to take one or two or more pages uh, and consolidate them. And essentially what you just need to do is you just go back again, in, in assuming these are sorted in temporal order, uh, go back in reverse order. Say this this page is newer than this one. Again, just like you're doing a read, go back and figure out what is the the, the latest version of or you know, of a log record for a given tuple, uh, and then you know that's the only one you need to store in your new consolidated page, right? And at that point, you can blow away these pages away because you have everything you would need for the updates that occurred that you that you stored in them. Right? Yes. 
The question is, are timestamps stored across these things? Typically, yes. Uh, yeah. Once it's on disk, not really. Uh, I'll explain why in a second. But there's usually timestamps, yes. All right, so, so he says, if you, get, if, you, if you start compacting this, won't your timestamps start getting messed up? That's what I'm saying. You don't actually need the timestamps, which is the next slide. Thank you. So once the page is compacted, we don't need the temple ordering anymore, because we know that a, there, for any given tuple ID, there'll be one, at most one log record corresponding to it in, in, the, in, 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 the, in the compacted page, right? So we actually can get rid of the, uh, we don't have to do the temple ordering anymore. We don't have to keep timestamps. We'll keep timestamps for other bookkeeping things, but but we don't have to keep them in temporal order anymore. And it, yes. Uh, that should be does not. Yes. Let's fix that now. There we go. There you go. Let me make sure they break, break recording. All right, we're still recording. Good. Okay. All right, there you go. Uh, does not. So, bring it back. Sorry. There we go. All right. So, uh, does not need any temporal ordering. And so, instead, what you can do is actually change to be to sort the keys based on the, the identifier, the, 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 the key ID or the, the key. Right? And then now, if you do this, you don't maybe need to maintain additional uh, sort of fine grained indexes to jump to exact locations. You can sort of use uh, a more coarse grained index to jump to different offsets based on keys and then just do binary search after that. Right? So uh, these are, if you do a sorted uh, compacted table or compacted page, pages on disk, uh, these are called, sometimes called SS tables or sorted string tables. This comes from the original, uh, I think, the Google Big Table paper from the 2000s. Right? They sort of coined this phrase. But it, this, this approach is used in, in a bunch of different systems. Yes? Yeah, so his point, yes. So, yeah, he's actually right. I can remove this. Um, his comment, which is correct, is that I don't need to retain the delete 101, delete 102. Because I don't care that they're deleted, because there'll be some other index up above that would, that would know they wouldn't have an entry for 101, 102. So therefore, when I do a lookup, say, does 101 exist? Is that of me take, taking me down to where, hey, it's been deleted? It just comes back with nothing. It, like doesn't key that does not exist, and therefore I assume it's, it's been deleted. Or actually, I don't care whether it's been deleted or just never existed. So to your point, yes, I will fix that too. It, it does not we don't need to keep track of deletes. Okay. So this type of compaction that I'm describing here, uh, in the RocksDB world, they would call this uh, universal compaction. And the basic idea is that you just look at two contiguous uh, uh, sorted files, because you write these out in a bunch of different segments. Right? So these two guys together, they, uh, since they appear one after another in temporal order, I can just combine them together, delete the old ones, and, and have now a larger, or a compacted one that, that is more slimmer than the original two. And likewise, I can take two different ones of different sizes. Again, long as they're contiguous in time, I can just do compaction like that. In uh, RocksDB, they also have an approach called level compaction. And this is actually where the, the word level. RocksDB is, a, is Facebook's fork of Google's LevelDB. Uh, Google wrote LevelDB, I think, for Bigtable. It was like Jeff Dean and, and the other guy, Sanjay. Um, and actually, when Facebook forked it, one of the first things they did, they got rid of MF. Because Google used MF, and Facebook said that's a bad idea. Let's get it, get rid of it. Uh, so uh, the basic idea is you have different levels where you're going to have uh, compacted files that will be of sort of different sizes, right? And so as you go along, as you keep creating these uh, compacted files of different sizes, once you have enough of them or two, two or more of them, you can then compact them into a larger one at the next level, right? And this goes away. Generate two more balls, two ones at the level above you. Uh, then now you have enough to actually then consolidate these guys. And then once you have enough at the next level, you can do compaction down below. So the idea is that you keep sort of 
traver or cascading down, having larger and larger uh, SS tables or, or log file size sizes uh, that just get you know more consolidated over and over time. Right? Yes. This question is: Are the log files always on disk, or could they be partially in memory? So, you. If you need to read them, you got to bring them into memory, right? But you'll never like once they're in memory, though, you never write to them. There's still that that they call it the mem table, where there's that in memory pages where I keep that's where I'm pending new ones. But I may need to go retrieve something that's that was on disk, so then I have another sort of memory space where I can bring in the the ones from uh, that are out on disk. Correct, yeah, so the statement is, and for all of these, like again, w once it's written out the disk, I may need to go read it again, and I, get, I can bring it back into memory. Right? But I'll never insert new things into it. Yes? Uh, so this question is, uh, this question is, after consolidation, could I actually have some empty space at the end where I could fit a few more records, but I don't? Yes, that, that would be the case, yes. But again, a page is like, Harvard page is, is like, you know, four kilobytes. So if I, if I miss out on, on a kilobyte or two kilobytes, three kilobytes, who cares? Okay, think big, think petabytes. Yes. No, no, the, the, these are on disk. This is on this is on disk. Yeah, you 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 would have sort of one page. Uh, again, they'll call it the mem table. It's larger than a sixteen kilobytes. It's usually larger. You would have the 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 staging area in memory, a pen to pen to pen. When that gets full, you write that out. So all of these now, when you're doing compaction, these are ones that are out on disk. Yes. This question is. After they've been compacted, are these still sorted? Yes. Why wouldn't they be? Right? You're just doing merge sort. You just, uh, yeah, you just, you, you're checking to see whether, you know, it's like, you know, right, right to left mer merge sort. Like, you know that this one comes, this one maybe comes before that one. So therefore, I know if this one's newer, this should, if I, if it exists over here, I can just drop it. And that goes in the new one. Yes. His question is, what is the condition for deciding when is time to compaction? There's a bunch of different thresholds. Could be by size, could be time, a bunch of different. RocksDB has a bunch of different flags you can set for these things. Yes? So it's, yeah, so his question is, if this, yeah, so these, these the, the lower levels, they can be terabytes, right? Or gigabytes. Um, So again, you would have an index. The question is, the statement is, these compacted files can get really, really large. That means I can't bring the entire thing into memory. And the answer is yes. You would usually have the header of the of the file would contain index metadata, right? Here's like jump to this offset if you're looking for values of, of you know, within this range. Jump to that. So you can bring in partial chunks, partial pages of the larger compacted pages. Yes. This question is, do the compacted files overwrite the previous files? Uh, no, they're, they're entirely new files. Again, because you can't overwrite the, anything existing in this architecture. OK, cool. All right, so uh, as I said before, log structure uh, storage managers are more common today. Uh, the term log structure merge tree or log structure storage, as I'm using here, they're pretty much inter inter interchangeable. RocksDB is probably the most the most famous one of these uh, log structure storage systems, um, and a bunch of other systems have their own either they either use RocksDB or they, they have a clone of RocksDB written in Go or or Rust or whatever. Um, but they, you know this approach is, is pretty common these days because again from a uh, which we'll talk about later and from a distributed system perspective it does make things a bit easier if you just do log structure stuff. But Postgres, SQLite, Oracle, uh, MySQL. All of these will be page oriented systems. Okay? So, what's one obvious downside of this? 
with this approach. Yes. Yeah, so he says for, if you're doing a lot of reads, it could be worse potentially because you got to find the records that you're looking for, right? Which may not be so close by or contiguous in in in, uh, in, in, the, in the compacted files. So let's say now I do a uh, I do a write uh, to to a record. It's in, it's in the memory page. It's written out the disk, and then it gets you know. It never gets, we never change the tuple. So my log record is always the latest version. So I got to keep it. But it keeps getting compacted over and over again. So what am I doing? I'm reading it in, then compacting it, and writing it back out. Then reading it back in, compacting it, and writing back out. So this is called write amplification. All right. It's basically for, for a given write, given like a like single logical write to a record or a tuple, how many times am I, I going to have to physically write it out over and over again? So th this is one of the big downsides, in addition to the reads being slower uh, in this approach potentially, uh, with these log structure storage systems. If, you're, if your disk is fast and cheap, eh, who cares? If you're paying Amazon for your IOPS, then you're going to care, right? A lot of times, so, so Amazon has their own log structured version of Postgres called Aurora. Uh, it's also for MySQL. Uh, it's supposedly, you know, they claim it's faster, not, not always. Uh, and speaking now from, 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 from with our startup with Autotune, we see people that are running regular Postgres versus Aurora Postgres, and people, uh, they don't realize how expensive sometimes switching to Aurora is because of this log structured stuff, right? Yes. The question is, where does the right amplification come from? Like if I update, if I insert tuple 103, I never update it, right? I just insert it once. That that log record it goes from in memory page out to a you know to, to on disk SS table page, but then over time it, it gets compacted over and over again. So to do compaction, I got to read it back in, compact it with another page, and write it back out. So if you, if you again if you're doing the leveled one, I'm reading and writing it out over and over again, and that's called write amplification. Yes. Yes. So, so his statement is, we could use we could use this log structure approach for any for relational database, NoSQL database. Absolutely, yes. We're at the low, lower bowels of the system, right? We don't care. The upper, like we don't care what the data model is up above. Which is again goes back to the. the the blockchain chip, right? Like it's all I did was do. It's basically a key value store. I insert, I do puts and deletes on key value pairs and gets on key value pairs. It's up to the upper part of the system just to interpret what those, what the bits are. It's getting back for the value. Uh, so I say it again. The, yeah. Yes. Uh, oh, so I mean, page oriented versus like log structured. Right. Yes, correct. Yes. So like, TidyDB is a relational database that does speak SQL. CockroachDB is a relational database that does SQL. It uses RocksDB. Like, we're in the we're in the bottom layer of the system. Okay. Cool. All right. So yes, yeah, so go ahead. Yes. Okay. Shout out. Go for it. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes, correct. So in a, his, so his question is, or his statement is, in what I've shown here today, uh, if you have up, if you have to update a single attribute of, a, say, a multi-attribute tuple, so the, the, the table has ten columns. If I don't update one column, I have to write out all ten columns in in the log structure storage, right? Yeah, I think that's the slot one. The slot one, yes. Uh, 
depends on how it's actually being stored because if it's, if it's a column store, you could get by without that. So it, typically, the for these key value these, these log structure key value stores, they don't know what's in the value portion, right? It's just a bunch of bytes, and so to do what you're proposing, you'd have to have additional metadata up above and say, I know I only wrote this attribute. So if I want this tuple, I got to go here for this attribute, that here for that attribute. You can do it, but nobody does it that way. There's nothing that precludes you from doing that. But like at the lowest level, it's just a key value store. Put, put and get and delete. That's all we see of, of a key value pair. All right, cool. So let's actually talk about what, what are in, in tuples now. Um, and again, this is independent of whether it's a log structure storage or, or page oriented storage, right? So the tuple is essentially going to be a sequence of bytes that are that don't necessarily have to be contiguous, which is sort of alluding to what he was asking about, which I'll talk about ne on next class. Um, but look, we sort of ignore that for now. Just say, okay, if we have we have a sequence of bytes, we want to be able to interpret that and say we know that this is a tuple from this table. This table has this schema, has these attributes with these types. We know how to then reason about what, what those bytes mean. Right? And the information about what the schema is will be stored in the catalog, which we'll cover at the end. That tells us, basically instructs the database system to say, OK, at this offset, this tuple, you'll find an integer, you'll find a float, and so forth. Right? Um, so the, the sort of four basic groups of data types that, that most systems will support are integers, floats, varchars, and, and dates and timestamps. So for integers, big ints, small ints, tiny ints, all right, these are times that we call it exact precision numbers or exact numerics. Um, for this, we're just going to use, think of this as like the C++ implementation of, of what an integer is, which is actually based on, on the, the IEEE 754 standard, which specifies you know, for a 64-bit integer, you know, your two's complement or whatever you're using, here's what the bits should look like. It's, we can ignore endianness for now. Uh, the, the, depending on how portable your database system out, it, you want it to be, you can deal with you know flipping bit orders based on endianess, but we can ignore that. So you can literally think of this like if I call if I write a C plus plus program and I declare a variable with int, you know with, with the var name, that's essentially what the database system is doing when it stores the integer for you, right? And no matter whether it's you know eight bits, sixteen bits, thirty two, sixty four, it's all the same. For uh, for decimals, uh, there's gonna be two variants, and we'll spend time on this. There'll be the inexact ones, the floats and reals. Again, these, these are defined by the I triple, tri, I, the, the 754 standard. But then also the database system will maintain what are called fixed point numerics or fixed point decimals. And the implementation of this will vary from one system to the next. And the, again, the idea here is you want to have exact values, exact numbers. You use this for like money, scientific measurements, and so forth. Uh, for very length strings, like, like so var chars, var binaries, text and blobs. Typically, the way this is implemented, you would have at the beginning of the value, you would have a, a header that says, here's the length of, of the value, and then followed by the actual the bytes that would follow it. For uh, things that were related to like, like strings and text and, and characters, the system is also going to need to worry about collations and sorting. Uh, you don't store that with the, the value itself, but it's some setting in the system to deal with you know, A comes before B, and B becomes before C. Because that, that can change depending on language or locale that you're doing. Right, there was a bug in Postgres a few years ago where, because um, they rely on libc to do, do collations and sorting, uh, for some, like, libc upgraded how they sorted Unicodes. And, like, you could have strings that in the old version of Postgres would one would be less than another, but then after the, the upgrade, it, it would flip because they were relying on the operating system to, to figure these things out for you. The enterprise systems write their own collation and locale stuff themselves, right? Because that way it's more portable and it's more exact. And then for the, the timestamps, dates, uh, and other things, there's a bunch of different implementations, uh, whether you want 32 or 64 bits, whether you keep track of like the, the milliseconds, nanoseconds, microseconds, since the Unix epoch, whether you store the timestamp and so forth, all that we could ignore, right? It's, it's how it says, it's, it's not that interesting other than like, the different systems will do different things. Um, but I want to spend time on talking about, again, the distinction between floats and reals and numerics and decimals. Because to me, I think this is interesting. So 
if you go, if you ask the data system for uh, a float, a real, or, or a double, uh, what you're going to get is actually the same thing you get when you call, like, declare a, a you know, float or real variable in C or C++. Yes? Uh, so the statement is, is there a DMA system that gives you uh, arbitrary precision? Yes, that, that's what we're talking about here. That's, that's the next slide. That's the fixed point precision. Uh, Python, I think, is, we can test this. Python is only, I think, 64 bits for floating, float, like floats. Uh, but it, it, they're basically doing the same thing we're talking about here. It's fixed point precision. Um, but again, but if you call float, yeah, this is, again, the difference between database systems and uh, and, uh, and and programming languages like if you call float in SQL in most systems you'll get the the harbor version of a float which is imprecise the variable length if you call for a decimal you get the Python version even though Python calls that a float right we're wrong. we're right they're wrong uh, so again so these uh, these sort of native types will be really fast because they'll have harbor support for this. But you're going to have rounding errors, right? So this is like two thirteen, five thirteen all over again, uh, where you can't you you know see how you can't get exact decimals in or floating point numbers in in C plus plus and most programming languages. Um, so if you take a real simple C program like this, I have two floats x and y, and if I just try to add them together x plus y, uh, I would expect to get um, something like this. Or sorry, sorry, I sorry if I if I don't if I don't specify how many leading zeros I want, I'll get what looks like the right answer. Uh, but underneath the covers, actually what's happening here is, is the, the printf function is doing some rounding for me. So it's hiding what's actually going on. If you try to get the full precision, the, all, all the, the leading zeros, then you get values like this. right? Because again, the harbor can't represent exactly you know, uh, these kind of decimal numbers. right? So this is fine for some things, like if I'm trying to record the temperature in this room, who cares if it's, you know, we don't get it, you know, 72 degrees exactly as it's being measured. But if it's your bank account, you would care, right? If you're trying to do something very precise, like, you know, shoot, shoot a rocket in space, then yeah, you, you, you want exact values. So to handle this, the data system is going to do called fixed, help support fixed precision numbers. And the idea is that this would be a numeric data type with potentially arbitrary, uh, Precision and scale, you can specify what you want, but you would use these data types when rounding is unacceptable. Yes? Uh, in C or in data systems? The question is how would you check, what happens when you check for equality in, in these systems? Uh, you would probably get the same, you, you basically get the same behavior you would get in C or C. Yes? This question is, last week I showed, I showed an example where um, uh, this question is, if, if all these data systems are using for floats and reels, uh, the IEEE 74 standard, why did I show that example? I think whereas MySQL gave different results than uh, everyone else. I, it's, it's a MySQL issue. I don't know what that was. Yeah. And I, I don't, sometimes they play games where like, uh, like an Oracle, I'm pretty sure, like, we, we can test this out. Oracle, they use an alias for float and real. So even though you, you think you're getting the, the variable of like precision, they just alias that to the numeric and decimal, right? Because they have their own implementation that's actually pretty fast. Um, MySQL doesn't do that, but I, I, yeah, we have to go back and look at that example. I don't, I don't remember. It was, I mean, it was off. I don't know what they were doing. I would, I would chalk that to MySQL rather than the hardware. Um, all right, so. The basic idea here is that we're going to, again, we're going to, you can think of it as almost like storing like a string representation of the decimal. That's not exactly how it works, but we'll, we'll see what it looks like in a second. But like, but then you keep track of like where the decimal point is, what comes up for, what after, is it negative and so forth. But there's a bunch of metadata we're going to keep track of for every single value in order to give us exact precision. And so th this doesn't come for free. We're going to have to, the, the operations will be more expensive because the data system is now going to do a bunch of additional stuff itself. 
that it would normally let the hardware do in, in a single instruction or a few number of cycles, right? So I'm going to skip this for now, but this is something that, that I had a former student work on. We never finished, but we had our own sort of library to do fixed point decimals, to try to get the same performance as you could get in the 754 standard are almost as good. Um, but we, we never actually am, am finishing it. The student's at actually Oracle now doing awesome there. All right, so let's look what Postgres does. So if I declare a numeric type in Postgres, this struct here is actually from the source code. This is actually what they're going to store, right? So you can just see there's a bunch of stuff. There's like there's a 32-bit integer for the number of digits, the weight, the scale, the sign. And then they have this uh, numeric digit alias, which is just a, a string. So they're basically storing, this, again, the string of the decimal, or the decimal literally as a string, has some additional metadata to say, here's how to interpret the, the, the string. Uh, and, then use, and that's how they're guaranteeing exact precision. But of course now, when you, uh, when you look at the source code, just add two numbers together, right? It's not, again, not number plus a number as a single, single instruction, which you can do fast in hardware. It's all this stuff, right? This, okay, this function, which I'm cutting off here, this is just to add two numerics together, right? So it's, it's obviously going to be a lot slower. But again, the standard says you have to have, you have to provide this, this sort of accuracy, this precision. Um, but how you actually implement it is up, is up, up to the database system. So here's how MySQL does it. So there's is different. They have uh, different things they're storing. Um, and then the way they're going to store the extra digit itself is instead of doing a character string, it's going to be some kind of integer. And, and just like Postgres, they have a function to add two numbers together that is way more complicated than uh, to, you know, literally adding two numbers together. So to get a sense of how slow this actually is going to be, let's do some quick demos. Right, any questions before, before we jump, jump into the demos? OK, cool. So what I've done is I've created uh, two tables in a bunch of different data systems where I pre-generated a, um, here we go. So I, I, I pre-generated um, a file with 10 million de decimals, or it's a single table, has two columns, I just, and I have 10 million numbers, or 10 million rows of two decimals, right? And I have two versions. I have one with using real types, and I have one with, uh, with decimals, right? This, this, so this is Postgres. So I can do select count star. From test reels. And I get 10 million, right? And the same thing for decimals. So for this, what we're going to do is run a query that is just going to scan through the entire table. Um, Actually, let me turn off a bunch of stuff. So I'm going to turn off, uh, this is Postgres. So we're going to turn off parallel queries. And then the JIT is basically how they do just-time compilation for, for expressions. So we turn off the, all that fancy stuff. And this is sort of like raw CPU performance, how fast you can read, uh, you know, can you read the data in memory and, and add two numbers together. So first thing we're going to run is the, the decimals. And that takes uh, about two seconds. And again, it's just doing a summation of the first column plus the second column. So I have to read all 10 million rows and compute this, this together. And here's it for reals, right? Less than a second, 700 milliseconds, right? Again, because of that function I showed you where it had to do a bunch of extra work to do this addition, because it's checking all, all you know, the contents of, 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 the, of, the, of the, the numeric type. So let's jump to MySQL. So MySQL by default is, uh, is well, MySQL is single threaded. So unlike Postgres and a bunch of other data systems, they can't take a single query, break it up into different pieces and run it into different threads. One query is, is one thread and always in MySQL. All right, so just double check, I'm not crazy. Select count star from test decimals. You have that. They have tab, tab completion. And then test reels. All right, so do test decimals. 
my sequence is going to be slower than, than Postgres. So that took four seconds. I can run it again. Wait, what, why is this shocking? It's what? Then Postgres? Four seconds versus two seconds? 2x? Yeah. It's not. It's not an order of magnitude, right? You're shocked by two seconds? Okay. You have high standards. That's good. Oh. <laughs> um, so let's do test reels. All right, three seconds. Right? But again, so like the relative difference is between the reels versus decimals, that's what we care about. Right? Yes, in the back. So his statement is this time. His, his statement is, well, first of all, he doesn't want to be rude. Appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> that this time is not is is not being dominated by things that are uh, related to adding two numbers together. So, so before a class, I preloaded all the data into memory. It's all in memory, right? So th there's no disk overhead. Uh, the the, the one second overhead I would say is 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 because the of the difference between the you know the interpreting the decimal versus interpreting the, the actual reels. So like to your point, yes, there is all this extra overhead of like fetching the like getting the page in the page table, even though it's in memory, interpreting the bytes, looking at the slot array. All that sucks, right? So so the exact numbers I don't care about, it's really the difference between the two. So they're doing the same work in terms of like getting the pages. Jumping to the to the to the where the data is located, it's that one second cost is the addition cost. Right. If you go back to Postgres, uh, we can do explain analyze, um, and I think we have to do buffers. Or is it buffer? There's a way to tell. I forget. Forget how to do this. There's a way to do it in Postgres. You can say, show me whether uh, how much of this is being spent from. Sorry, you can you can show how much is being spent for the different operators within the query plan, but then you can also determine is it ever going to disk. Um, I'm forgetting the syntax right now. Right. So this is actually it's getting a little faster here. Uh, no, actually, sorry, it got slower. It could be from the analyze part. But again, the 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 performance difference is again because there's this overhead of interpreting what the values are and, and generating uh and, and doing that computation. All right, so I just got Oracle running before class, which is always a bad sign. Um let's see if it works. So we'll do the same thing, run the same query. And in Oracle, you got to turn timing on like this. We have to manually set the terminal to not round our data, our results. Um, so there's the first query. So that took, uh, what is that, 60, 60 milliseconds. And then for decimals, oh, because it, uh, I, I must have not, I didn't load the data. That's probably why. Yeah, I didn't load it. All right, that's my fault. All right. Well, you would get, you would actually get the same result because, again, they do the ALS between reals and, and decimals. Um, last one we can do for, uh, is, is, is for SQL Server. So for the syntax here, um, in this select statement, it's kind of hard to read because of the, the coloring. But there's that little option, max DOP, that's the degree of parallelism. So that's basically how you turn off uh, multi threading in, in, uh, in SQL Server. So we set it to degree one, meaning it runs, it'll run once. It's a one, run with one thread. Right, so that took 1.2 seconds. If I run it again, it takes the same time. Um, and I'll run it on the decimals. And it's a little slower. Yeah, it's a little slower, uh, but like not by much. I mean, this is because again, in the 
in the commercial systems, the 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 decimal implementation is very highly optimized. Uh, whereas the Postgres MySQL one, it's it's correct, but it's not. I don't think it's as optimized as the commercial ones. Okay. All right. So any questions about yes? So, so his question is, will multi-threading make a big difference here? Probably not for not, not for 10 million rows, but we can try that in Postgres. Um, I think we can do five, four. Let's see what it does. Yeah, it, it'll, it'll do four threads, right? So cut the time in half in this one, right? Execution time, uh, 3.69 milliseconds. Or if I set it back to zero, The statement is: uh, If I if I do multi-threading parallel query execution, will that make will that will that? Will well, the ratio change? Uh, I mean, it's pretty much CPU bound because you get you have to do the, you have to invoke that function, like you have to do CPU work to do that the, the addition for those. So. If that's the high pull in the tent, in, or it's not the high pull in the tent because there's other things, but like, if you can do that in parallel, then like, the ratio should be the same. I think the answer is. We can just try it, right? Like, so set it to four. Uh, do test decimals. So what it was what before it was. It was a th three, yeah, so it was like 3x slower. So now in parallel, it is uh, it's about the same. Yeah. All right, any other questions? All right, cool. So uh, let's deal with large values now. So. Uh, most database systems are not, are not going to let you have a tuple that exceeds the size of a single page. Uh, so if the page is eight kilobytes, I can't have a tuple that resides on that page by eight, larger than eight kilobytes, right? But obviously, I, I want I want there's tables with, with attributes that are you know, have you know one megabyte uh, columns, right? So the way they're going to handle that is through what are called these overflow storage pages, where in the the sort of are called the base tuple, or the, uh, the yeah, it's called the base tuple of where you have you know where your your page number and offset point to. In in the in that tuple, instead of having the actual you know one megabyte chunk, you'll instead have a pointer, which again will be, will be another page number and offset to this overflow page, uh, that can then be stored you know st storing the larger data, right? And typically these overflow pages will be larger than the regular table page sizes. Right, to accommodate uh, larger attributes, larger data. Um, so again, the great thing about the relational model in this abstraction, the independence between the physical layer and the logical layer, you don't know, don't care whether your you know one megabyte value is stored in line with the base tuple or is one of these overflow pages. The database system's responsibility to go get that overflow page and stitch it together as if it was stored contiguously anyway, right? So the 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 criteria that, that the different data systems use to decide when things go to the overflow page varies. Uh, like in Postgres, they're called this toast, the toast tables. Uh, so if the, the, the value that you're trying to store is larger than two kilobytes, then they'll shove it off in a separate page. Uh, by SQL, if the value is larger than half the size of the page, uh, and SQL Server, it's just larger than the page in general, right? So again, you can store larger things over here, but again, the, the base tuple can't exceed the size of the of the of the page the, the, the database page. So if I, I can't make a table that has a billion columns, uh, even though each of those columns is one bit, because that won't fit in a, in a single page. And Postgres says it's a hard error. You can't have more than two to the 16 uh, columns per table, right? The other great advantage also too, if you're doing this, this overflow page is that now you actually can compress these larger values separately than the, uh, than the base tuples in the, in the original table, right? So Postgres will do this with gzip or, or, or uh, 
for Z standard, they'll, they'll compress the overflow page, but they don't compress the, the base table pages. Right? Because typically these these large you do the larger the data is, the larger the piece of the data is, the more likely you're the less likely you are to update it. Right? If I store a giant image, how often, you know, for like your profile photo on, on a website, how often are you changing that? But you might change like your login timestamp more often. Right? That's much smaller. So you can go compress these things and you can update it if you want, uh, but typically people don't. Right? And these overflow pages can actually be chained together. So if you're if you're a large chunk of data it doesn't fit in the in the overflow overflow page by itself, you can sort it in another overflow page. Just, you just have a portrait of these things together. The other thing you can do uh, is what's called external value storage, where you can tell the data system uh, the data that corresponds to this value or this attribute doesn't actually exist in any pages that the data system controls. It actually exists on a file on disk or some network address at some remote server or the cloud service, right? So the idea here is that the this attribute C would have some kind of URI or URL to, to some other location of data. And the data system can, can knows how to go open that file and suck it in and bring it in back to you through the terminal as if it was in the actually really stored in the data system. So not all systems support this. Uh, Oracle and Microsoft do. Uh, they have this B file, a file stream. Postgres, you can sort of do this with called what they're called foreign data wrappers, but it's less. The whole table has to be external, whereas in uh, in Oracle and Microsoft, you can say a, a single column or single attribute will be external. So in this world, also too, you can't. The data system is not allowed to actually update the file because it's outside the database system. It's sort of outside our, our, our walled garden. Uh, and so there's no guarantee that uh, if, this, if the data system crashes, if your external file is being opened by something else outside the system, we can't. We don't know. And they might trash the file, and we we can't recover it. So you should lose a bunch of guarantees on the system uh, to do this. Yes. The statement is. Uh, question is, what's the difference between um, doing this this approach with these sort of native types that know how to point to external files versus just storing as a varchar? Here's the URL of where the file is located, right? Because the data system will just, it, it can 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 go read the data if it knows it's one of these types, and then bring it back for your select queries as if it was being natively stored as a blob. Yes. Uh, so when I say you can't manipulate, I mean like I can't call update to update this record, right? Through SQL, I can if it's on you know, local file and disk, I can open up the terminal and modify it myself. But that's outside the control of the database system. You can do whatever you want. Yeah. I'm gonna take an idea, take a guess on why you actually want to do something like this. What's a good example? Yes, perfect. So he said that. Go beyond images, say multimedia files, videos, whatever, sound files, uh, that you could have different backup strategies and storage strategies for uh, for the for these file types rather than being sort of embedded together with all your, your database data. Absolutely, yes. And that sort of goes back to the example I was saying before, where these large files you typically read a lot all the time. You write once and read read, read a lot, never never update them. So maybe you don't want to store this, these, these images in the backups of all your with all your user data, because if you have one good backup, that's good enough. You don't need to back it up every night. Uh, and that you can then maybe store it in, in a different server. Yes, yeah, so that's, that's the typical use case for this. Um, there's a paper uh, that came out a few years ago by Jim Gray uh, when he was at Microsoft. So Jim Gray is a name we'll hear about uh, throughout the semester. He won the Turing Award in databases in the 1990s. Uh, that's, he worked on the System R project. He vetted a lot of the stuff that we'll be teaching this semester. Um, Right. I'll bleep that. All right, thanks. I should do a blooper reel. I have like I've dropped this thing all the time over the years of just being on. Oh, um, it's all on YouTube. All right, so uh, right, so he wrote a paper where he basically said, and under what conditions would you would you actually want to store data as a blob versus like store it as an external file as he as he recommended, and they're 
their basic uh, this paper is something 2005. It's it's pretty old now. But back then they said if the if the the, the data you're trying to store is larger than 256 kilobytes, store it externally. Uh, otherwise, store it as a blob. I think that number has changed, but certainly for a large image file, you probably don't want to store this in your database, right? Because again, like thinking like storing on Amazon, Amazon database storage, they charge like 204x more than they, like if you just, if you want to store something in EBS uh, versus like an RDS, even though it's the same backing like storage system, they charge like two to four X more for the database. So maybe you don't want to store all your like large files in your database because you're going to pay a premium for that. And as he said, you want a separate backup and storage policy for uh, for these larger things. But in some cases, I think two, I think 256 kilobytes is actually too small. Probably three megs, four megs is probably the right number. Um, a few years ago, we had the inventor of SQLite come to see me and give a talk, and he talked about how on like cell phones, uh, it's actually faster to store thumbnails for for like your little phone app inside SQLite than rather than scattering them on the file system because you don't pay the f open syscall penalty to go open up a thumbnail. The, the database system is already open, right? The, the database file is already open, and you can go retrieve it more, much more quickly. So in that case, for for those thumbnails, that was faster to put in the database than have an external. But certainly anything. Anything probably beyond 10 megs, you probably don't want to do. OK? All right, so the last thing to talk about is the system catalogs. So we're not going to go into details of how this is actually implemented. Uh, but this, basically, this is the metadata the system is going to maintain about what your, what your database actually looks like. So all the things we talked about before, tables, columns, views, indexes, all the ACLs and permissions and other things, all this is going to be stored in the database. And you can almost think of it as, as, a, as, a, as its own database. Typically, the way this is implemented, the correct way to implement this, would be the database stores the catalog in its own database. Right? It's just another table. Um, now, in your procedural code, or in the code that actually builds the database system, you're going to write that in, in, like, in Rust and C++ and Go, whatever. You don't want to write you know, SQL queries in your programming language to go get metadata about what, what's in tables, because it won't work, because it's a chicken before the egg problem. Like, if I need to run a SQL query, and I got to go look up the catalog, what, what I need to run. Then I got to run queries in my catalog. But to do that, I need a catalog. So like, you, typically, the, the way this is implemented, or the right way, to, the way this is implemented, is you have like wrapper code in the, in the database system itself that can access the tables directly to get the catalog information. But the catalogs themselves are just be stored as tables because you get all the sort of the durability and the safety guarantees you would for regular data you can get for your uh, your catalog data as well, right? And of course, there's the issue of like, how do you, you know, how do you bootstrap the the, the database system with, with with the catalogs when there's nothing before? And all that is done through procedural code. So, typically, the the this used to be a good example. What separated the so the the, the commercial enterprise systems versus the open source systems, because the, the the enterprise systems had really robust catalogs that were transactional that had all that, all the safety guarantees. Um, and can do schema changes without blocking queries and so forth, right? That has changed in, in a lot in, the, in recent years where MySQL Postgres have gotten a lot better. Uh, SQLite is single-threaded, so for single, th single writer threads, we, we can ignore that. But um, the, the, the open source guys have really caught up in the recent years with the commercial guys. Like you, typically, the commercial guys would be much better. I don't have an example I can show for MySQL because this is the old version, like 5.7. But it used to be, in, my, in the old version of MySQL, I just go to the directory uh, where MySQL stores all its data. If I, just, if I create a directory inside that, MySQL thinks it has a, has a new table or a new database, right? Because it's, all this stuff is being stored outside the system. They, they fixed all that when they, when they upgraded to MySQL 8. So the, the, the standard way to, to get information about what's in your catalog is through what is called the information schema. And this is defined in the catalog, or sorry, in, in the SQL standard. Um, and these would be sort of read-only views that give you a sort of relational view of what's in the database. Uh, but in addition to like writing queries on this, which is sometimes awkward, all the different database systems will have their own shortcuts to retrieve this information. So to get what tables I have in my database, you would write the SQL query like this. But in Postgres, MySQL, and in SQLite, you can use these shortcuts in their terminal. Basically, what happens is if I call slash D in Postgres, the psql client will then convert that into a select statement uh, that knows how to retrieve the catalog information. I can show that quickly. Um, 
right? If I call slash D, I get this, uh, but I can basically do the same thing. I call slash. This is going to be a lot of stuff, but uh, well, this, whatever you can't see this. But this this is basically what the catalog looks like, uh, and you, you can sort of see here. Here's you know here's our tables that we created, and it's it's just another table. Um, actually, you go. They have other aliases. Oh, PG tables. Nope. Right. There, there's a shorthand view of this. Right. You can see all the tables we have in this. But if I do explain, you can see that it is just a. Um, uh, you can you explain again, showing the query plan. They're querying PG class and namespace. Right? And slash D is basically do, doing the same thing. Okay. Uh, for within a, a schema itself, right? This is how to get all the, the attributes within the table, and then everyone has their own uh, version of this, right? All right, any questions about the catalog? Yes. So, the question why is this not in a human readable format? Uh, I, it, it, so, if I do. Um, there's just a lot of columns, right? So these are all the columns that are in it, and it just overflows. There's a way in Postgres, the PG, PSQL terminal, where you can like have it be a more ver vertical view. I turn that off because I don't, I don't like the view of that. But if you just scroll over, it's all here. It's just a lot, right? All right, any questions? All right, cool. Um, so. The log structure approach we talked about is an alternative to the page order architecture. For our purposes going forward, we don't care what's un underneath. Uh, we'll talk about row stores versus column stores next class. And in that case, the you typically don't build a column store on a log structure storage, except you could have the, the right portion of the column store be a log structured. Again, you, you'll see this idea of like this append only thing where we just put log records in, and then we apply the maybe the updates later, either compaction or merging. That, that'll be a reoccurring theme we think throughout the semester. And this notion of like, I could have multiple versions of, of a tuple existing as different log records, that's gonna show up again when we talked about multi-version concurrent control, because that's basically how it works. That's what basically Postgres did back in the 1980s, right? And then we'll see again, that the storage manager won't be entirely independent of the rest of the data system. There are some assumptions that, are, that are, we'll have to make about what we know is underneath, but for the most part, we, we should be okay going forward, okay? All right, guys, hit it. They ain't cold, it's taking its toll. I got a pack of zigzags, but ain't got nothing to roll. Hit the bus spot, let me cop a dub, show some love. Three for 50, is you with me what I'm speaking of? I'm in the studio at nine, so it's song. And I'm not leaving till I'm finished with my next song. Fucking with that dope, you know it make my legs flow. Just grab a double deuce or two and then I'm good to go. Yo, I get this shit done and get it over with. Cause the whole world's waiting for another Tears Town Street sound. Found a motherfucker if you label me a fake. I'm like a cobra and I'm down with the super snake.